I would say number one out of the gate is how incredibly hard traders are on themselves. You guys don't practice a lot of self-compassion and a lot of self-empathy. There is some sort of confusion for traders that being hard on yourself is going to get them to that pinnacle of success. And I, this is controversial, will argue to my dying day that is not going to get you to the pinnacle and stay there. Welcome back to another episode of the After Hours Podcast. Today, we're very excited to have on guest Kim and Curtin. So Kim, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Awesome. So I want to start off with a very simple back to basics question. So how'd you get started on the world of Wall Street? Um, I was really helping my uh, family and I was working in uh, bookstores. I love books. So I was in retail, which doesn't make a lot of money. So I had read uh, in my bookstores, you know, sections I was responsible for, including the business section. And I had read two books, uh, Liar's Poker and Jim Rogers' book, investment biker. And those two books sort of gave me a heads up that if I needed to make some serious money, Wall Street was the place. So that's what drew me to it in the first place. Awesome. Awesome. And what got you to get into the world of psychology on Wall Street? I hired a coach myself. I was in uh, one of the largest hedge funds in the world, one of the top 50 in the world. Um, And I was certainly financially being compensated handsomely. Uh, I felt that a lot of my gifts were being utilized because it was a very strategic role. I was juggling quite a lot and I had to see, I was like playing seven chess games at at a time and I constantly had to see multiple steps ahead. However, there was a part of me that had been early, I had been inspired early in my life by Joe Campbell, and he talked about finding your bliss. And so on one hand, yeah, I like the money. Yeah, I like the strategy aspect, but there was this kind of like haunted feeling of that I, this wasn't the bliss. So I hired a coach, an executive coach, and had this transformational experience. And very shortly into the coach practice for myself, the the experience, I really just had a spear in the chest moment of knowing this is the bliss, me coaching people and facilitating what that coach was facilitating for me, the empowerment. Uh, It was just like, you know, truly like a bolt of lightning that hit me as my own coaching journey began. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's super cool. Um, maybe just for like some people who are watching this and they maybe like don't know about a trader psychologist or they don't really have a clue. Could you maybe explain kind of the role that you're supposed to play in like a trader's life? Sure. You know, ultimately uh, coaching itself, I'm a coach. I'm not a psychologist just for clarity's sake. And there are people who I, I will just speak of my own experience. I've had therapist. I've had uh, the experience of what therapy feels like. When I experienced coaching, I found to be paradigm shifting. It's very different approach. Part of what's unique about coaching is that it holds the client naturally creative, resourceful, and whole. And it also holds the client as not broken, (laughs) that they have actually the solutions within themselves. So what coaching ultimately is for traders or for anybody who engages in it, it's allowing you to have acts. First of all, you're being listened to deeply without an agenda. Even the people that love us in our life, they have an agenda, right? They want us to be happy. But a coach is neutral and they will hold the agenda that you come to the coaching with as the ultimate goal. So yes, sometimes to get those goals, guess what happens? You're going to have to, you know, crawl through mud under barbed wire while there is, you know, explosions happening above you. That's terrifying. But a coach, if they are worth their salt, they're going to 
call you forth and say, look, you want this end goal? That's what you're going to have to do. So don't give up now. Whereas a loved one may not be able to like hold space for that because they're like, oh, they're wet, they're cold, they're unhappy. But a coach is going to be like, too bad. Are we allowed to curse here? Oh, you're yeah. fine. <laughs> Too bad. Fuck that. You want to <laughs> You're going to have to get through this, you know, <laughs> obstacle course. Yeah. And that when you have somebody see you as powerful, you live into that. You live into that. So I feel a coach ultimately is helping traders. When I work with traders, especially like there's so many kind of like inner gremlins or inner saboteurs they're up against. Right. And if they want to make it to the goals they set for themselves, they're going to have to find that grit within themselves because I'm not going to be there every day for their trading, but they have to get something accessible to them that has previously not been accessible for them to an be anchored to that grit that is within them. It just has to get awakened. Yeah. Go ahead, oh. Go ahead Harry. I was just going to say, uh, I really liked what you said about kind of like the agenda as far as family goes, because a lot of the times when you get advice from family members, they're going to say like, oh, don't go into trading. Trading's risky or, oh, don't do this. Trading's that. Um, and as far as like your day to day job and like the clients that you kind of help coach and help see, what would you say the most like the most challenges are for them? You know, like your clients, like maybe top three issues because I feel in trading, like for the most part, generally everyone has the same kind of issues or at least in the same kind of ballpark, you know? Um, so what do you think your top three issues that you would see would be? Or you can, and not only top three, it can be whatever yeah. you want. You know? Yeah, yeah. But no, it has to three. specifically be three. If you can't okay. do that, okay. not I'll acceptable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not <four. laughs> Uh, I would say number one out of the gate is how incredibly hard traders are on themselves. You guys don't practice a lot of self-compassion and a lot of self-empathy. Incredibly, incredibly hard on yourselves. And I think in a lot of ways, there are there is some sort of confusion for traders that being hard on yourself is going to get them to that pinnacle of success. And I, this is controversial, will argue to my dying day that, that is not going to get you to the pinnacle and stay there. You might be able to get to the top, but there is going to be an internal implosion if that's the way you operate because it's coming from fear, scarcity, and making yourself wrong. So I would say number one is uh, if I could, had a magic wand to wave over traders to stop being so brutally hard on yourself. I get you might want to have more discipline. I get you might want to be more committed to the work ethic, but through beating the hell out of yourself isn't the way forward. So that's number one, but I'll just pause there and see if you want me to I can totally relate to that because that's something yeah. I deal with myself. I'm nonstop. That's something that my girlfriend tells me, my parents tell me, everyone tells me. And I don't know if it's if that's just the type of people that trading attracts or if trading turns you into that person, but I could totally Great relate to that. Questions. You got to be a masochist to love this, truly. Like, <laughs> I, I think there is a way, I think you're right, Alex, the concept of how people who are high achievers undoubtedly are drawn to this. But having worked now with high achievers for 17 years, I can tell you that there is a cost when you are tremendously hard on yourself there, that creates a big hole in the gas tank of you. And ultimately, who wants their gas tank constantly leaking on a road trip? Like, you're going to have to stop more frequently. You're going to be depleted emotionally, physically, psychologically. It's not in your best interest. But here's the key. I don't want anybody listening to this, including you guys, to now beat yourselves up for being hard on yourselves because that's the cycle. It's like a downward spiral. Just notice, wow, I'm really hard on myself. And here's another little, you know, favorite phrase that I like to give people is instead of asking why, why do I do that? I wonder why I'm so hard on myself. 
take that word away and use the word what. I wonder what that's about. I wonder what is underneath that. Because when we all hear the word why, even just when talking to ourselves, just physically, if you guys are willing, tune into your body, like close your eyes just for a second. And I'm going to say to you, why did you do that? Now, just notice the contraction probably your body goes into. Maybe you want to put your arms across your chest. Maybe you want to protect yourself. Why? Because you feel like you're being judged, right? So when we ask ourselves why, or someone else does, we start to justify, defend, and protect ourselves. That is not a place of curiosity. So if you replace why with the word what, then you start to say, huh, I wonder what that's about. I wonder what this, uh, you know, sense of being so hard on myself, I wonder what that's about. And maybe when it started, because there's probably a really good reason why the, this thing started. But the only way you're going to get to the solution or clarity about that is if you meet yourself with some compassion and some empathy that it's there in the first place. All right. So I before we go that. any further and I start crying, what were your other two? I want to stay on this topic here because something that I have a question about is we as humans are programmed with certain emotions through evolution that caused us to be able to act a certain way. For me, my evolutionary headache is that I feel greedy. And most of the mistakes that I make in my own personal trading stem from the fact that a deep feeling of greed. It is a human emotion that all of us come with. Some of us handle it better than others. But mm -hmm. for someone that you know struggles with, whether it be greed, whether it be too emotional, these human, these human emotions that have come through us over thousands and thousands of years of evolution to survive, right? We are greedy because the more we have, the longer we could survive. We are uh, emotional because that helps us get some nurture or some comfort that we may be missing. So these human emotions that come to us on demand instinct, how do we combat that? Or how do we learn to either A, fight against that emotion of greed or B, embrace it in a certain way that helps us get to where we want to go because that's something that i struggle with and i know that other traders struggle with that and for me i mean i've made a very good career out of this and i'm very happy about it but i still feel the need to push my size and my trading due to greed so, so why is that if it's okay, I'm going to put a bit of a reframe on some of what you said, because I hear what you're talking about, but I want to, I want to reframe it for you to consider that greed is actually not what's driving you. Okay. Possibly what's driving you is a need for security. Now you could say to me, but Kim, I technically have security now, correct? And there could still be this sense of not having enough security. And that could be because of some old previous experiences years ago when you didn't have security and that perhaps wound hasn't healed yet. And so that sense of not having enough plagues you because it feels like it's still not enough. So I'm going to yeah. pause and check in with you. Yeah. So that, that makes a lot of sense. And maybe it goes back to the fact that when I started trading, I blew up accounts. I lost my security when I first started trading. Correct. So maybe that, that uh, bullet in my chest when I first Correct. started and blew up how many accounts, I don't even remember how many accounts is now still coming back to haunt me. And yes. the question yes. is, and yes, now now let me pause and let me let me hear what you have to say. So so the key then is really getting curious about that fear is still sort of it's the the best explanation I've heard is that when we have an experience that's painful, 
trauma is a word that I feel today perhaps gets overused. So I'm careful to not call that trauma, although it could be for everybody, it's different. But when there's a wound, let's just call it a wound, if nothing else, okay. that is a hole that if it hasn't, you know, remember when we cut our knee, what would our mothers do or our caretaker? They would pour peroxide over it and it would sting like hell, but it would heal and get the pus out. Very few of us, when we have a wound today, emotional or otherwise, do we do anything around the healing process. And so that stays within us, similar to an earworm. Did you ever like hear a piece of a song as you get out of the car and then damn it, that song is with you all day. Why? Yeah. Because the brain likes to have completion and the earworm is constantly wanting to get to the end of that damn Britney Spears song. And yet it's not able to. And you know how you get rid of an earworm? You go listen to the song, all the way to the end, and then it's gone. The same with those wounds, the same with those pains. So all those losses, Alex, that you potentially haven't let yourself heal from are still in there getting kind of tripped and tripped and tripped every time you see, oh, I could get even more, and that potentially gets that fear inside calmed down. And what I'm saying is that is just dealing with the surface to really heal it, we're going to have to go down into the basement on where it's scary, damp, wet, and uncomfortable and have you physically feel that worst case scenario that happened to begin with so that it can finally, inside of you, finish processing. Yeah, that's yeah. a very good point. That's a very good point. Um, since Alex did an issue, I actually have one too, you know, that <laughs> I would be willing to throw out. Lay it up. Okay. So like I've been transitioning a lot more into kind of like swing trading and stuff like that. And my problem is that I'm always too early, but the move actually fucking happens. That's my problem right now is that the stocks that gapped up last week, I was actually in the week before, but I just didn't have the fucking patience to hold them or whatever. You know, they went up a little bit and I was like, oh, whatever, I'll just sell this. Obviously, I'm fucking wrong then. And then boom, this week I see fucking... Alex, this is moving. I'm like, God damn it. I was fucking in that last week, you know? So I'm just wondering, like, how would you diagnose that type of problem, you know? Well, uh, the patience that you spoke to, this is this is a different way of trading for you, right? Is that what you're yeah. saying? Yeah. yeah. So, so when did you start this new uh, process? Probably like six months ago I tried it. Okay. And is the patience the biggest part of the dilemma you're facing? I don't know if it's patience or I'm just getting in too early. Yeah. So is that possibly it's not so much patience as much as the strategy isn't fully formulated. True. True. Right. Could be that if, too. You're getting, if you're getting in a week early, like five minutes or an hour early is probably patience related. If it's a week early, that means possibly that the new strategy isn't tight yet. Yeah. Which is actually, actually that could be something as well, you know, cause it's just, yeah. I always have this issue. Like even in my like normal trading, like intraday where like I've, I've like made tons of money, you know, um, I I've always had this issue of just getting in like a little bit too early, you know, and yeah, but, translating but, to my kind of other one, you know, Well, let's not make it wrong. But again, these are the two words that I ask every client to please, you know, bring into the conversation, curiosity, and neutrality. If you were looking at this like a scientist in a lab, you wouldn't have a judgment. You wouldn't be, you know, making the mold in the petri dish wrong. You would just be like, "Huh, this seems to be happening." Yeah. This often, the what are the variables? I'm kind of curious as that you've changed this strategy just six months ago. I'm kind of curious, like, what's the motive that this has changed? What's the motive? Are you doing swing trading now for reasons that perhaps are you trying to get some needs met as opposed to it's it's really surfing what's happening in the market right now and of the strategies you could choose you know all of us if we go back to that you know comment that Alex said at the start this is the kind of most important piece that I'm trying to say to everybody here is 
we are not driven by our wants. We are driven by the needs that live below the wants. So at the surface, it looks like impatience. At the surface, it looks like greed. But ultimately, those are just like kind of superficial words underneath that are basic human needs. Again, like, see, maybe you know what is What's the heart of why you change strategies? Are you able to kind of speak to that? Honestly, I think to me, I just had a bunch of friends just making a ton of money swinging. So I was like, fuck, I'm going to try this too then, you know? Right. My kind of like normal trading, you know? Totally. So and it comes totally. down to greed for me too. Even though greed is the superficial word, word it comes down yeah. to that for me too, but, you know? Well, let's just- well, that, probably just that probably just indicates that it's the top and it's time for everybody to sell once Harry gets on board. <laughs> <laughs> but but let's just call it security because if we put the word greed on it, it's a judgment word, right? It's you making yeah. yourself wrong. So it's like, oh, this is possibly going to secure me more security. Yeah. So that right there already tells us that perhaps there is a part of you that also doesn't feel that secure with whatever the other strategies are that you have. That's fine. And it could be that you aren't possibly staying very true to your strategy currently because it could be that you are more motivated by the security than you are the accuracy of that strategy. Sure. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Why are humans so stubborn? Why are we so stubborn to say, you know what, I think this stock is going to go up. I think the stock is going to go down. Fuck it. I'm going to hold. And then the inverse happens, right? So what what causes that stubbornness, that need to feel right? Because most of our culture and even our families that we grew up in shamed us when we were wrong, right? Very infrequently do we get acknowledged for our mistakes without being made to feel ashamed for them, right? We are the culture, Madison Avenue, when we compare ourselves to other people, what do we compare ourselves to? Oh, look at him. He's so fit. He's got a six pack. Oh, look at her. She's so beautiful, even though she's older. Like, it's like perfection is constantly put in front of us as the ideal. And anything less than that, we're made to feel like we're not as good. We're not good enough, smart enough, you know, lovable enough. We all are in need of love and belonging. And we're all been told just because of this world that we're brought up in that we, unless we do certain things to earn our love and belonging and our worthiness, then we're never going to be truly uh, accepted. That is fundamentally terrifying to all of us because we all know as human beings, we're not going to get too far without a tribe. We need a tribe. That goes back to the days of cavemen. We were going to be too danger in danger if we didn't have a tribe. So when we are feeling like we have hum our humanity with the mistakes that every human makes, then we feel like, oh, my God, me being human with this misinformation might actually mean I don't get to have that most important quality of any life to experience love and belonging. So I don't see it as like something's wrong with us. The stubbornness is what's kept our asses alive, but we're just misinformed about what is happening. We all need love and belonging, but our worthiness can't be earned. And most of our cultures, and even dare I say world religions, have made us think we have to earn our worthiness and we don't. It's a birthright. And there's nothing we can ever do to unearn our worthiness. So let's say we have somebody that's stubborn like that, which is, I think, all three of us talking to you right now. <laughs> uh, pretty much a lot of people. What kind of uh, scenarios have you witnessed and what steps do you think the people that surround those stubborn individuals should take to kind of breed that culture of love and empathy? What should people do in order to change that pace? 
I'll say that it all starts internally with ourselves. It isn't about other people. It's about us. What is the relationship we have with ourselves? It is the most critical, most important relationship we will ever have. There is nobody who's going to be with us when we were born and there when we go out but ourselves. I would get very curious about is that relationship you have with yourself solid? And if it isn't, start to get curious about how to redesign that relationship with yourself. If you are going around judging everything you ever do, if you're constantly making yourself wrong, if you're constantly having your inner critic or inner saboteur driving your bus, then you're going to have to get that one out of the driver's seat and you get behind the wheel of the bus. So first it starts with yourself and learning how to practice empathy. I, I, all of my coaching is informed by what I call my five practices. Those are in my book, Transforming Wall Street, and they are undoubtedly used over and again in every coaching call. And I practice them every second of every day. These five practices have changed my life and they've changed the clients I've worked with for all these years. And one of those practices is self and other empathy, learning how to practice it. Plus, if you ever want to be a contribution to anybody else, if you don't practice self-empathy, you are going to be really hard pressed to be able to extend it externally. So just like the oxygen mask, you know, on the plane, we're told, even to parents, they're told you have to put the mask on yourself first before you even put it on somebody you love. Because if you don't have oxygen, you're not going to be able to function. And that's the same with needs. Most of us, if we're not getting our basic needs met, we are operating on empty and we can't extend that empathy to those around us, never mind even ourselves. So it starts with self-empathy and that's what my universal needs list, you know, it's it was created by Marshall Rosenberg. He's the, uh, he's the creative language called nonviolent communication. I started to study his work before I even became a coach because it was so powerful and that work just continues to empower me and people that I share it with. So you mentioned your book, Transforming Wall Street. Um, I ordered it, planned to read it. I, I was really grabbed by the intro. And um, one, of the, one of the things I wanted you to outline for us or kind of try to, try to shed a little light on is the, the, the title of the book for those that want to read it. And we'll link it down in the description below, but it's called Transforming Wall Street, A Conscious Path for a new future. What do you mean by a conscious path? What it means ultimately is that consciousness is simply self-awareness. And if we start with ourselves, right? There, my favorite quote in the book right at the start is from Rumi. And it says, yesterday I was clever, so I want to change the world. Today I'm wise, so I'm changing myself right? So consciousness to me is not about the external. It's about the internal. If we each individually become more conscious, if each of us individually become more self-aware, that opens up a whole field of possibility that previously wasn't available to us. And that's what I see is what creates that new path, the new path for you individually, whoever's listening to this, and the new path for finance, right? For Wall Street, for every trader. Imagine if we had traders who are operating from a place of consciousness as opposed to these words we've thrown around today, greed or, you know, fear or, you know, uh, comparison, like trading would be a very different landscape. So would the markets. But the point is, how do you just start with where you are? I ask myself every day, and I've been doing this work for myself for a long time on myself, how, where can I bring more consciousness to whatever it is I'm in the middle of doing? Where can I bring more self-awareness. Am I being triggered? Do I have my old wounds being poked right now? And then I 
don't get judgy on myself. I just try to pause and have some empathy and be like, ooh, yeah, I got really triggered by that thing so-and-so said. Okay, that just tells me I have some more healing to do. Is awesome. there certain traits that you've seen, whether it be personality or emotional, that has led to you seeing a trader performing more optimally than another? For example, they always say that the best traders are the most humble because they have been humbled from the market and learned. So I'm curious uh, for you, Kim, mm -hmm. is there a certain type of you know, something that someone needs as a trader to be able to get to that high performing seven, eight, nine, ten 10 figure level? I think you definitely hit the nail on the head with the concept of those who are humble. Part of what comes with that humility is, look, it's, it's sort of this razor's edge because you have to have tremendous confidence and yet you can't let it turn into hubris. So ultimately, I think part of the culture's uh, interpretation of humility is like, you know, somebody who's just like, oh, I'm not worthy. I, I don't think that's true humility. I think what true humility is, is a willingness to be able to be with your humanity without judgment. You're like, yeah, I'm human. I have flaws. I'm always going to have them, but I'm not going to let that distract me from that high achievement that I feel I am striving towards. So I would say it's a razor's edge balancing of this incredible confidence, determination, perseverance, and humility. And the other thing I'd like to add there is a practice of gratitude, a practice of being able to notice all that you currently do have. That opens up again the vista of possibility when you're grateful for what you have right now and not being always in the future of what is to come, but what is current right now. Those yeah. qualities. I see That's a really good point. Because for me, when I was trading at my most optimal is always when I felt like I didn't need money. Whenever I felt like I needed to make more money for my own insecurities and I would force my trades or get them larger than usual to combat that, I would find myself spiraling down. So I think that's a really good point of just being appreciative of what you have because once you feel that level of, you know what, I'm thankful for my $100 a day, not why isn't it 500, right? I think back again to a very toxic mindset because that has happened to me, right? I've made a lot of money. I've lost a lot of money. And every single time that I make 5,000, I'm like, why isn't it fucking 25,000? I make 100,000. Why is it not 200,000? I make 300. Why is it not fucking half a million, right? But whenever I'm in that mindset of, hey, I just made four grand in 30 minutes. And I do that every single day, nonstop, no matter what. All of a sudden, I'm looking at, hey, I just made a hundred grand in a month just being really happy. So I think that's something really important that a lot of people have to pay attention to is the fact of if you are not grateful for that dollar that you make, I guarantee you, you will not be grateful for the ten dollars that you make. It's a how about grateful that you get to trade? How about yeah. grateful that you have a more than one monitor. How about yeah. grateful that somewhere the rent's being paid, even if it's somebody else in your family that's paying it. Like, <laughs> how about grateful that you have your two arms and two legs if you're lucky enough to have them? Like, the gratitude list when you start to go really deep is just, you're just like, oh my God, I'm a walking miracle. Everything right now is a walking miracle and yeah. talking miracle. And that is just incredible. I guess it's just insecurity because that's 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 what happens all the time is like you never really I never well, me, I'm speaking for myself. I know everyone's different, but I never really stop and smell the roses. I like I'll give you an example. Yesterday I went to a concert and it's a concert that I've been wanting to go for a really long time. It's one of my favorite artists. I got front row seats. I got an Uber black on the way there, on the way back. I got a nice dinner and the entire night maybe cost me 
probably with every, everything said and done, less than $5,000. And I was like, God damn, like I'm able to do my favorite thing with my favorite person, being really happy the entire time. And I kind of clocked that in, in my head and say, you know what? Like this was probably one of the best days I had and it cost me less than 5,000. But here I am trading and trading and trading and trading, making 25, 30, 50, but 50 is not enough. 50 is not enough for the best day I just had is five grand. And that number may be different for someone else. Maybe they're, yep, but their thing course. is 100, 200. But my best day yesterday was a five grand day with my girlfriend. And that, when I was able to clock that into my head and say, you know what? Like you just had a really good day for 5,000. Why are you so ungrateful for 50,000? It kind of started to rewire my brain in the right way that says, you know what? I have to start being more grateful for what I have. And in the past, I would say, all right, I'm waking up in the morning. Who cares? It's whatever. But like reality is like that matters too. That matters too. And because I'm taking that for granted, you know, God forbid, I don't want to learn the hard way as to what it's like to wake up and be healthy. But stuff like that, those little scenarios of spending money and clocking it in for that's me. That's consciousness, Alex. That's consciousness. I'm, that's I'm just surprised. I'm surprised you found two front row tickets to Taylor Swift for five thousand dollars. <laughs> even I can't afford Taylor Swift. I can't even afford those tickets. <laughs> but that's she'll, true, she'll hear this podcast and send you some free tickets. Uh, I'm hey, I those would go. Immediately. Those I are twenty thousand tickets. I'm flipping those. I'm a trader. I got to make my money somehow. <laughs> Jeez, oh, man, that, I would go. But, that but that gratitude is a practice, and we yeah. we don't realize how. Um, you know, how much effort, like, it's not something most people do because they, they dismiss it. They think it's, oh, it's just, you know, nice words, but to, to actually practice gratitude is a, it's, it takes effort. It takes energy. And the other thing too, and I'm going to bring this up because I actually brought this up and just sent a video to a client, um, gr being grateful potentially also means discomfort. And let me explain why. If I come, I'll just, again, speak for myself. I come from a different kind of life. I've had some harrowing experiences in my life. And so I have a tendency to be hyper vigilant. I have a tendency to always kind of be looking over my shoulder when everything's going right. I start to get a little nervous because I'm like, ooh, What's the shoe that's going to drop that I don't oh, prepare yeah. for? So joy, and Brene Brown talks about this, sometimes is the most terrifying place we can, emotion we can feel because we're afraid that we're going to potentially be caught off guard. And so I think some of why it's hard for people to spend time in gratitude is because then they're potentially being with like all the good stuff in their life. And they're like, wait a minute, if I'm not focused on the bad, stuff i might be taken by surprise i don't want that to happen yeah yeah that happens to me too i say when when the hell's the uh, domino gonna fall what's gonna happen yeah. When, is, yeah. when am i gonna something's gonna when's happen? the trap when's when's pennywise gonna come out of the the yep. sewers yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a very dangerous mindset too because if you're always expecting the bad or looking for the Correct. bad the bad's gonna find you yeah. Or yeah. you're going to find it like just like, you know, they say you buy a red, you know, beetle and all of a sudden there's red beetles everywhere because you're focused on it. Yeah. So that's why it's so important to really begin to stretch this muscle of gratitude, because what happens is you start to find all the good stuff. And then, OK, if you start to bump in, I bump in all the time to that vigilance within myself. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for what could go wrong. Why don't I focus on what could go right? Why don't I put some time and energy there? And that's actually a pro practice called uh, appreciative inquiry, where it's something we used when I you know, coach in organizations. I will go in and I will actually ask everybody to tell me what works here with this collective of people. What and I would say, even to your trading, anybody listening to this, what do you do well? Focus for a month on everything you do well. Focus for a month on 
everything you do right in your trading that nails it every time. If you start to only focus on all the things you do well, what's remarkable is so much of the stuff that doesn't go well just drops by the wayside. So see what happens if you give that a whirl. Yeah, uh, I have uh, two questions kind of like back to back. And I guess they can kind of like fall in hand with each other. Number one is how would you recommend traders deal with stress? Because stress is kind of like a big thing. Um, and even if you say that you're not stressed, you probably still are a little bit under the surface, you know? Um, so, uh, Those number are the one, most stressed people, the what? people that say they are not, they <laughs> yeah, really are. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, number two would be, uh, how would you recommend a client manage, uh, burnout? Because burnout's kind of a big thing too, where, you know, you're just, sometimes you're just burned out and you just, as I much as you want, what? I can piggyback right on that as that what comes right good. So yeah. go ahead, Kim. You know, ahead. as much as yeah. you want to show up, you know, you're just burned out. You're just tired, you know? So like, how would you recommend stress and how would you recommend burnout? I, I think burnout ultimately comes from too much stress, right? And not enough uh, breathers. So I would say you're probably, again, you don't want to make yourself wrong, beat yourself up. It's like kicking a man when he's down, right? But you want to say, huh, if I am, let's just start with the stress, right? Because if we can mitigate the stress, then burnout hopefully doesn't happen. But if it's already happened, let's just start there. At square one, you have to admit it to yourself that it's not weakness. <laughs> like stress and burnout, there's nothing wrong with it. We live in a plugged in society. We're constantly being triggered. Our phone is constantly giving us alerts, but whether it's text messages or it's social media, we're constantly plugged in. So I would say get comfortable with being disconnected for periods of time. I can understand if somebody's still having to trade. It probably can't be during the trading hours. But outside of that, there's a lot of places where you could probably not be plugged in. One of the guests I had on my podcast a while ago was a woman called Celeste Headley who wrote a book called Do Nothing. And she gives us crazy amount of stats that a brain, our cognitive ability to really do deep work is maxed out at four hours a day. Think about that. Every time we are doing something heavily cognitive after four hours, we are not giving it our best. We are going to be compromised in some way. So I would say first, find out are you comfortable with doing nothing? If you aren't, if that triggers you, then get very curious about that and see if you can start to find ways to be with emotionally, physically, in your body, that nothingness. For some people, it's very hard. It really brings up stuff for them. So I would say that practice, you know, I I teach a, a practice called self non uh, emotional non-resistance, which is allowing yourself to be with whatever comes up. A lot of the work that I do is called somatic work, which is basically taking that elevator metaphorically down from your head into your body. Stress lives in the body. Part of the challenge with for traders is it, it, you're all an intellectual bunch. You're all super smart. So you have a tendency to stay up here in your head. But for stress to process and dissipate, it has to be felt. And you can't think your way out of your feelings. You have to feel your way out of your feelings. So that would mean you'd have to practice taking yourself out of your head into your body so that you can start to feel the stress. Maybe it shows up as tension. Maybe it shows up as like a sense of dread. Maybe it just show, shows up as a sense of utter exhaustion in the physicalness of you. I would get in tune to that and then I would learn how to surf it. And that means physically feel it, not for an hour, but for like a minute or two and just see, okay, I'm noticing a lot of tension in my chest. Huh? Isn't that fascinating? And then just let it be without trying to fix it or change it or move it. Because when we give our body our presence, it moves, it shifts. But what we usually do is push it down, 
I shouldn't be feeling this, or I don't want to be feeling this, or this isn't manly, or this is, you know, for a wuss. Like all of that stuff takes us back into our head and takes us out of our body. That's for me, the best way stress is dealt with. It's a physical experience. We have to process it physically. The same with burnout. That's coming on the other side of this kind of experience where somebody probably hasn't given themselves any spaciousness to be feeling and processing the emotions that perhaps they've had for a really long time that are hard to be with. So for the last few months, uh, things that speaking on that burnout piece, things have really ignited in my trading again, but it was brought on, which I think by a big move. I went from living in Texas for the last 10 years to all the way to a rural side of Colorado. And part of that was I through 2020 and 2021, as we saw in the markets, that was the hottest bull market we have ever had. And I got burnt out because every day it was a new opportunity, a new opportunity, a new opportunity. And to not sound greedy, it was every day I'm making more and more and more than I ever had in my entire career. And then 23 came and the end of 22 And I got really tired of the markets. I got really tired of everything that they were doing. And I talked to Alex and told Alex, I said, look, man, let's go out. And so I flew to New York and we went out, hung out. And while we were talking, I said, dude, I'm just, I'm toasted. I'm burnt. I said, I'm not motivated to trade anymore. I'm not motivated to really do anything anymore. And, uh, I started talking to him about this move to Colorado that we've been thinking about. And I said, you know what, man, I don't know. It just feels right. It feels right. It feels like the move I need to make. We went out here, we came out here and it was just a breath of fresh air. You know, I was in Dallas, Texas in the heart of it. And I mean, Alex was even in the thicker part of it in New York, like with COVID when COVID happened and everything locked down, I went, I hate being in a city. And it made me realize I despise it. And if that were to ever happen again in my life at any point, I was like, dude, I got to stop. I can't do this. I can't do this. And I started explaining this stuff. And Alex goes, dude, I've known you for a while and you need to go. He's like, everything you're telling me, you need to go. And so I came out here and for the we got here in April. And for the last three months, I have done more outdoors, which is what I love. I've done more in trading, relaxing patience wise. And it was that big move of getting out of the condensed city, getting out of all that toxicity that everything I was around is what I hated is what I grew to hate. It made me hate it so much. I had to get away from it. You went from New York, Kim, you went from New York all the way to Hawaii. You went from the hustle and bustle of the world to the people that don't even realize the sun has risen. And <laughs> so my, oh, they, know, they know the sun has risen because we're out on the ocean when it's rising. Right. Trust me. Yeah. I'm up and at like 4 30 in the morning. So I can paddle at five 15 and watch that go. sunrise. So, so you started in New York and, you know, I started in Texas and that was where I grew everything. And I felt like I just had to get out of there because it just wasn't the best for me. Yeah. And fortunately, I had people around me like Alex and James and my buddies that were able to kind of say, dude, this sounds like you need to go. And what was it that led you from New York all the way to Hawaii, halfway across the world nearly? Well, first, can I just pause and just acknowledge you for seeing and noticing that you were being so compromised by the city and that you weren't kind of getting nourished by the environment. I mean, I think COVID did that for a lot of people. It turned the volume up on the things popping were low grade tolerant. You were tolerating things. But once COVID came, it was like, no more tolerating this bullshit. Life is short. 
and this is not working. I think what you did for yourself, and I'm so happy to hear how much your friends here supported you, because there's times when those decisions are so big, and it's hard to do them and make that leap without the support. So kudos to you guys for supporting him, because that was him saying, hey, I'm not getting my needs met by being in the city, and I'm feeling called to a place that's more filled with nature. And thank God you listen to that, because there are plenty who don't listen to that, and they, they go worse than where you were. And they just say, hey, it's over for me. So good job to you that you practice really good self-care and self-awareness because that's what facilitated you making this change for yourself. And nature is the best, best, you know, bomb for all of us because it heals us, especially when you're technologically plugged in and you're dealing constantly with like, you know, all your screens, you step outside and bam, everything goes away. You're like in the thick of the earth and the planet and nature. And it just heals us in a way that really very little can. So I'm so happy you're there. And that is ultimately what drew me to Hawaii. I came here initially because I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to house it. Uh, I was in, you know, born in Brooklyn. I never thought I'd live anywhere but New York City. I was totally snob. You know, New York City is the best place in the world. Blah, blah, blah. And I got to house it here to write my book, which was incredibly difficult. I needed to kind of get out of the hustle and bustle to focus on the book. I did a year and a half of research and did 90 interviews, which was way too much. I don't know what I was thinking. And I was like, huh, I got to put this all together. I need some calm, some quiet, and I need to save some money. So I was like, all right. I came for that first year and a half and I went back to New York, but I was walking up the stairs of the subway apparently slower than usual when this man walked past me. (laughs) You had that Hawaii pace versus the New York pace. That's how I felt when, uh, so we went, we have a buddy, Austin, Aloha trader who lives in Hawaii. And when we went to Hawaii, when we went to Philadelphia, all of us walking around are like, dude, come on, come on. on. You're way back steps behind us. And he's just like, La, 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 yeah. la, la. <laughs> and then I'm smiling at people on the subway. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> They're like, this woman's crazy. Why is she smiling at me? <laughs> like, what's the problem? I mean, if somebody smiled at me on the subway 15 years ago, and I'd be like, what's the problem? Like, it's yeah. just, you You're like, we're looking different- at me, man. What you see, huh? What you looking at? You got a problem? You got a problem? (laughs) (laughs) Like, I'm going back to New York, actually, in less than two weeks. I haven't been there in over five, six years. So I'm actually a little nervous. I'm like, ooh, well, I have my New York armor ready to go if I need it. I'm like, what if I lost my juju? (laughs) uh, Anyway, but this place, you know, I started paddling, outrigger paddling. It's in a six-man canoe. I've had these encounters with spinner dolphins and whales that are like, they're like a movie unto themselves. And to be on that ocean with the stars and the moon, and then to watch that sun come up behind these two mountains, I'm on the big island, so I have Mauna Kea, Mauna Loa, Guadalai, which is another mountain, Kohala Mountain. I mean, to be on that ocean I have my own business. It's stressful, right? I'm an entrepreneur. Like, it's just always something. But once you're out there on that ocean and you're in a canoe and you're close to the water and you deal with these sea creatures, it it does a good job. Alex, if we go back to that concept of humility, like, whew, that just humbles you right down to the bare bone. You're and then all like, of a sudden, a blue whale just comes up and swallows you whole and you die. Like, what are we going? What are we going? <laughs> Happy ending right there. <laughs> if that's how I go out, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. <laughs> Jonah survived. I think I can too. Yeah. Did you hear about those two women who did get swallowed by a whale? Got In San Diego, right? 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 Yeah. Dude, right? yeah. Yep. So, but luckily, our whale just came and one, one of the guys in my canoe who is Hawaiian, he started to do a chant. I had paddled with him for years before. 
He'd never done this before, but he just started chanting unexpectedly. And this whale came swimming to our canoe like it was a little puppy dog. And I was just like, I was scared to death. But I also was like, oh, my God, this is like the most magical thing I've ever had. Wow. So how has <laughs> how has Hawaii changed your practice as a business? What a, what what did it do for you going from New York to Hawaii? And how do you feel it's better for your clients I, or is it worse? And you're just going back in the next two weeks to right. scoop up the house and you're going back because everybody's like, I hate this. She's too laid back now. It's all about love. I'm just going and back for a visit. I'm just going back for a visit. My dad lives there and, um, and I'm going to get a, uh, I'm very fortunate to be being taken on a beautiful tour of the New York Stock Exchange. So I'm I'm looking forward to it. I miss the city. Look, I love the city. I love the fine cuisine. I love art. I love live music. You know, I used to go see musicians like three nights a week in the little, the you know, the bitter ends, all those places. So Hawaii, I believe, benefits my clients because what it benefits, the benefits for me is that it's helped me become more grounded. It has helped me become more present to the moment as opposed to living in the future, living in the past. So I believe I'm a better coach because of it. I believe I'm healthier emotionally, spiritually. It's I, I've always been a very spiritual person, but I think the, you know, the racing energy of New York and the fact that all the clients, for the most part, that I work with are in that when they come to me now because of this groundedness that Hawaii gives me, facilitates for me, I believe I'm able to be that anchor that helps them connect to the anchor within themselves. So I do feel it's benefiting my way of showing up as a coach because it's benefited me as a human and how I show up. I'm not saying I got it all figured out, but every time, even my day, like you can see my office, this is my office, like here, I'll just lift up my laptop. This is Grand Central, my old stomping grounds <laughs> in Grand Central. So like this whole office is kind of like my mini New York City. So there's times when like I can still be all caught up in it, right? And then I step outside and it's just like a very gentle velvet slap across the face to say, <laughs> let's get back to what's real. Let's get back to just being in this moment. And fortunately for me, every time I drive just to my office, very short 10, 15 minute drive, I live on a beautiful mountain overlooking the ocean, which I am so blessed to have that spot. I'm able to just get reconnected and regrounded. And one of my very close friends here, who is 90 going on 30, she's got more energy than I do. She's lived in Hawaii 30, over 30 years. And it seems I to me that's the secret to life. It, uh, once you're on your deathbed, just go that direction. Yeah. <laughs> she, but she is like, she's just got so much vim and vigor. So, so I'm friends with so many 90 year olds here. My paddling coach, he's a rancher, Uncle Manny Vincent. He ran, he's a rancher, 92. And wow. he's a paddler, paddling our Kauai High Canoe Club paddling, you know, teaching kids how to paddle. Like he's, again, he works probably more than I do. <laughs> and, and I work a lot. <laughs> and yet I just said to her at one point when I first got here, cause I was worried, like, oh my God, I said, Phyllis, in the 30 plus years you've been here, do you ever get used to it? Like, it's so gobsmackingly beautiful. I was like, do you ever get used to it? Cause I was like, and she goes, not for one second, not for one day, Kim. In over 30 years, I said, thank God, if I ever get used to this gorgeousness, you better just knock me upside the head because this is just like, how, how did I get here? I don't even yeah. know. Yeah. So would what would you recommend people do if they're in that stressful environment? Yeah. They're well, overstressed. They're burnt out. What yeah. would they do? You went from going all the way to New York to Hawaii. I went yeah. from going from... Texas hustle and bustle to Colorado, completely yeah. in the mountain air. I'm still trying to convince Alex to at least get to Florida. 
<laughs> it's a long island <laughs> yeah. some, some, some ocean air but but here's the thing like honestly i i just want to be you know cognizant that there are probably listeners who are like you know oh easy for you right you are able to afford to move there's some who can't move but here's the thing it's all internal like i could be i'm sure there are people who live in hawaii that internally have no peace. They don't, not even able to be present to it. And those with great practice skills probably can be in the middle of Times Square and have equanimity. I'm friends with a monk who actually belonged to a monastery in the East Village of New York City. And they were practicing monks. So you can, you know, what's that famous saying, right? You can be in paradise and still be in hell. You can be in hell and still have paradise. It's the internal. So it isn't about, yes, I'm fortunate to live in Hawaii, but ultimately Hawaii is available to everybody. The concept of peace is available to everybody because it's internal. And if internally you don't have that peace, it doesn't even matter where the hell you are. What matters is this internal dialogue. Is that in control of you? Does it have you on a leash? And if it does, you have to get unhooked from it. And that's going to take some work. And that's going to take some diligence. But if you can do that, then you're going to be able to feel like you're in Hawaii, no matter where the hell you live. So I would say, first, just have empathy for yourself to begin with, that you're perhaps so stressed and that you're feeling like, oh, how do you craft your life? to not be in charge of you, but you are consciously choosing what that life looks like. We're so lucky now with technology and the ability to just transport ourselves with music and sound on our phones, never mind those goggles now that are putting you into an alternate space. There's ways to do this where you can be present. Where are your triggers? How are you not being nourished? Notice what your basic needs are. Uh, there's a great little clip of Huberman that my girlfriend actually kind of reduced. And he talked about light, movement, and connection. And these are things we need every single day. Connection sometimes gets kind of overlooked by traders. Even, you know, communicating in a, in a Discord room is better than nothing. But having a phone call with a human being meeting even better in person with somebody, even if they're not your best friend. I just sometimes go to the coffee shop. I live by myself. I'm single. So there's times when I just need to have interaction with human beings. So I'll, I have a beautiful office here, but I'll go to the coffee shop sometimes and just hang out and talk to the old guy next to me. Talk to the young 16-year-old kid who's telling a girlfriend about her boyfriend problems. Like We need that connection with human beings. So make sure you're getting that every day. Awesome. Absolutely awesome. I'll just say last thing to close here. It's it's been phenomenal. Truly phenomenal and eye-opening and I am now convinced you are the Wendy Rhodes of the New Wall Street. <laughs> 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 and I'll just say that you know as, as you said, you know, people people say you know, easy for you, easy for you to make that shift. I ca I can't really do that and people and guys and gals that are listening to it, it there's a million reasons to never do something, but it only takes one reason to do it if it makes you happier. So yeah. thank you, Kim. Thank yeah. you so much for being here. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me and let me wax on so long. This is awesome. Thank you, Kim. Thank you so much. We'll thank see you, you in the next one. <laughs>